the subject of this seminar is going to be Taoism as contained in the teachings of Lao Tzu and Zhuang Tzu who lived approximately 400 years or more before Christ separated probably by 100 years from each other <clears throat> and as is often repeated Lao Tzu started out by explaining that the Tao which can be explained is not the eternal Tao and then went on to write a book about it also saying those who say do not know those who know do not say because there's nothing to be explained you must remember that the word explain means to lay out in a plane that is to put it on a flat sheet of paper all mathematics is done on a flat sheet of paper until very recent times but it makes a great deal of difference because this world isn't flat if you draw a circle on a flat sheet of paper it has an inside and an outside which are different on the other hand if you draw a circle around a donut the inside and the outside are the same so what we are first of all saying is that the Tao whatever that is cannot be explained in that sense so it's important first of all to experience it so we know what we're talking about and in order to go into Taoism at all we must begin by being in the frame of mind which can understand it you cannot force yourself into this frame of mind any more than you can smooth disturbed water with your hand but let's say that our starting point is that we forget what we know or think we know that we suspend judgment about practically everything returning to what we were when we were babies when we have not yet learned the names or language and although we have extremely sensitive bodies very alive senses we have no means of making an intellectual or verbal commentary on what is going on now can you consider that as your state just plain ignorant but still very much alive and in this state you just feel what is without calling it anything at all you know nothing at all about anything called an external world in relation to an internal world you don't know who you are you haven't even got the idea of the word you or I it's before all that nobody has taught you self-control so you don't know the difference between the noise of a car outside and a wandering thought that enters your mind they're both something that happens you don't identify 
the presence of the thought, which might be just an image of a passing cloud in your mind's eye, and the passing automobile, they happen. Your breath happens. Light all around you happens. Your response to it by blinking happens. So you simply are really unable to do anything. There's nothing that you're supposed to do. Nobody's told you anything to do. You're unable completely to do anything but be aware of the buzz. The visual buzz, the audible buzz, the tangible buzz, the smellable buzz, all buzz. It's going on. <laughs> Watch it. Don't ask who's watching it. You've no information about that yet. That it requires a watcher for something to be watched. For somebody's idea. You don't know that. And Lao Tzu says, the scholar learns something every day. The man of Tao unlearns something every day. Until he gets back to non-doing. And that's what we're in at the moment. Just simply, without comment, without an idea in your head, be aware. What else can you do? Don't try to be aware. You are. You'll find, of course, that you can't stop the commentary going on in your head. But at least you can regard it as interior noise. Listen to your chattering thoughts as you listen to the singing of a kettle. We don't know what it is we're aware of. Especially when you take it all together. And there's this sense of something going on. I won't even say that. This, you see? This. Well, I said it was going on. That's an idea. It's a form of words. Obviously, I wouldn't know if anything was going on unless I could say something else wasn't. <laughs> I know motion by contrast with rest. So while I am aware of motion, I'm also aware of at rest. So maybe what's at rest isn't going on and what's motion is going on. So I won't use that concept because I've got to include both. And if I say, well, here it is, that excludes what isn't, like space. And if I say this, it excludes that. <laughs> I'm reduced to silence. But you can feel what I'm talking about, can't you? That's what's called Tao in Chinese. That's where we begin. Tao means basically way. And so course, the course of nature, of which Lao Tzu says Tao Fa Tzu Yan, which means that fa, dao, fa, means the way of functioning of the dao 
Zeyan, is of itself so. That is to say, is spontaneous. Watch again what's going on. If you approach it with this wise ignorance, you will see that you are witnessing a happening. In other words, in this primal way of looking at things, there is no difference between what you do on the one hand and what happens to you on the other. It's all the same process. Just as your thoughts happen, the car happens outside. The clouds, the stars. When a Westerner hears that, he thinks of fatalism or determinism. That's because he still preserves in the back of his mind two illusions. One is that what is happening is happening to him. And therefore he is the victim of circumstances. But when you are in primal ignorance, there is no you different from what's happening and therefore it's not happening to you. It's just happening. <laughs> so is you, you know, what you call you, what you later call you is part of the happening. You're part of the universe although the universe, strictly speaking, has no parts. We only call certain features of the universe parts of it, you, but you can't disconnect them from the rest without causing them to be not only non-existent, but never to have existed. <laughs> so, when you have this happening, the other illusion that a Westerner is liable to have is that it's determined in the sense that what is happening now follows necessarily from what happened in the past. But you don't know anything about that in your primal ignorance. Cause and effect? Why, obviously not. <laughs> because if you're really naive, you see that the past is the result of what's happening now. It goes backwards into the past. Like a wake goes backwards from a ship. All the echoes are disappearing, finally. Go away and away and away. And it's all starting now. What we call the future is nothing. The great void. And everything comes out of the great void. That's the way a naive person, and the, as I explained, if any of you were at my lecture last night, if you shut your eyes and contemplate reality only with your ears, you will find there's a background of silence and all sounds are coming out of it. They start out of silence. If you close your eyes, listen, just listen. You see, the bell came out of nothing, floated off, 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 and then stopped being a sonic echo and became a memory, which is another kind of echo, a wake. It's very simple. It all begins now. And therefore, it's spontaneous. It isn't determined. That's a philosophical notion. Nor is it capricious. That's another philosophical notion. As we distinguish between what is orderly and what is random. Of course, we don't really know what randomness is. If you talk to a mathematician about randomness, he'll make you feel quite weird. What is so of itself? Sui generis in Latin. 
That means coming into being spontaneously on its own accord. It's the real meaning of virgin birth, sui generis. And that's the world, that is the Tao. That makes us feel scared, perhaps. Because we say, well, if all this is happening spontaneously, who's in charge? I'm not in charge, that's pretty obvious. <laughs> but I hope there's God or somebody looking after all this. But why should there be someone looking after it? Because then there's a new worry that you may not have thought of. Like who takes care of the caretaker's daughter while the caretaker's busy taking care? <laughs> who guards the guards? Who supervises the police? Who looks after God? Well, you say, God doesn't need looking after. Oh, well then nor does this. Tao. Because Tao is a certain kind of order. And this kind of order is not quite what we call order when we arrange everything geometrically in boxes or in rows, uh, that's a very crude kind of order. But when you look at a plant, it's perfectly obvious that this bamboo plant <coughs> has order. We recognize at once that that is not a mess. But it is not symmetrical, and it is not geometrical looking. It looks like a Chinese drawing. Because the Chinese appreciated this kind of order so much that they put it into their painting. Non-symmetrical order. In the Chinese language, this is called Li, and the character for Li means originally the markings in jade, also means the grain in wood and the fiber in muscle. We could say too that clouds have Li, marble has Li, the human body has Li, and we all recognize it and the artist copies it, whether he is a landscape painter, a portrait painter, or an abstract painter, or a non-objective painter. They all are trying for Lee. And the interesting thing is that although we all know what it is, there's no way of defining it. But because Tao is the course, we can also call Lee the water course. because the patterns of Li are patterns of flowing water. And we see those patterns of flow memorialized, as it were, in sculpture, in the grain in wood, which is the flow of sap, in marble, in bones, in muscles. All these things are patterned according to the basic principles that is the Fa, Dao Fa, the Dao's principle of flow. There is a book called Sensitive Chaos by Theodor Schwenk with many, many photographs and studies of flow patterns. And there in the patterns of flowing water you will see all kinds of motifs from Chinese art. Immediately recognizable, including the S-curve in the circle, the Yang Yin like this. See? So, Li means then the order of flow. The wonderful dancing pattern of liquid. Because Lao Tzu likens Tao to water. The great Tao, he says, mm -hmm. flows everywhere to the left and to the right. Like water, I'm interpolating that, 
It loves and nourishes all things, but does not lord it over them. Because, he says elsewhere, water always seeks the lowest level, which men abhor. Because we are always trying to play games of one-upmanship and be on top of each other. Well, Lao Tzu explains that the top position is the most insecure. Everybody wants to get to the top of the tree, but then if they do, the tree will collapse. That's the fallacy of American democracy. You too might be president. The answer is, no one but a maniac would want to be president. <laughs> Who wants to be put in charge of a runaway truck? <laughs> So, Lao Tzu says that the basic position is the most powerful. And this we can see at once in Judo or in Aikido, which are wrestling arts or self-defensive arts, where you always get underneath the opponent. And so he falls over you if he attacks you. The moment he moves to be aggressive, you go either lower than he is or in a smaller circle than he's moving. And you have spin, if you know Aikido. You're always spinning. And you know how something rapidly spinning exercises centrifugal force. So if somebody comes into your field of centrifugal force, he gets flung out. But by his own bounce. <laughs> it's very curious. So, therefore, the watercourse way is the way of Tao. Now, that seems to white Anglo Saxon Protestants and to Irish Catholics lazy spineless, passive. And I'm always being asked when I talk about things, if people did what you suggest, wouldn't they become terribly passive? Well, from a superficial point of view, I would suggest that a certain amount of passivity would be an excellent corrective for our kind of culture because we are always creating trouble by doing good to other people. <laughs> you know, we wage wars for people's benefit. <laughs> and uh, educate the poor for their benefit so that they desire more things which they can't get. I mean, that sounds rather callous. But our rich people are not happy. Whereas the poor people of Haiti are. To judge by the way they laugh. And we think we're sorry, really, not for the poor, but for ourselves. Guilty. So, a certain amount of doing nothing and stopping rushing around would cool everything. But also it must be remembered that passivity is the root of action. Where do you suppose you're going to get energy from? Just by being energetic? No, you can't get energy that way. That is exhausting yourself. To have energy, you must sleep, but also much more important than sleep is what I showed you at the beginning. Passivity of mind, mental silence. Not, you can't, as I tried to explain, be passive as an exercise that's good for you. You can only get to that point by realizing there's nothing else you can do. So for God's sake, don't cultivate passivity as a form of progress. 
That's like playing because it's good for your work. <laughs> you never get to play. <laughs> Also, you get soft. You're not on the qui vive. You develop flabby muscles because you never get involved in a fight. And uh, so gradually, the successful group fails. The, the group which managed to obliterate all its enemies will f fall apart. So what are we to do about that? See, part of the whole joke of present-day international politics is that uh, the United States, in order with its vast prosperity and enormous facilities for living the lazy life, must have an external enemy to get excited about. And so the, even though the Cold War is in a way total nonsense uh, and everybody who's in the know about anything knows it, uh, that, uh, for example, an atomic war between Russia and the United States would simply end the human race. But uh, the populace has to be kept bamboozled. And we, uh, we, we keep fighting wars like in Vietnam in, in order to keep everybody excited and in order to make a fracas and to give the soldiers practice. It's a horrible business. But, but that's the way things run. And uh, the question is, uh, you see, can we run the human race without awful bloodshed, and murders and tortures and all that kind of thing? Can we somehow introduce a new kind of gamesmanship as a substitute for war? It's the same thing in business. Exactly. If you wipe out your competitor, then you have no reason to produce anything but a lousy product. And uh, then you may make lots of money because you wiped out your competitors. You've got the whole market. And then you've got this money. What are you going to buy with it? Well, you, there's nothing to buy except other people's lousy products who wiped out their competitors. <laughs> or who cheated the public by packaging the thing to look elegant, but it was nothing inside. That's all you've got to buy. So naturally, if you're a success in General Motors, you go and buy a Rolls Royce from England. Or you go and buy a Mercedes from Germany because they happen to be better cars. <laughs> or if you want to make a lot of money in the clothing industry here, making wretched prints, and you want some good clothes, what do you do? Well, you have to go to Mexico and buy the things peasants wear because they're still substantial, solid, damn good clothes. So you see, there's something always self-defeating in these attempts to succeed. Could say nothing fails like success. So for this reason then, the Taoist always had an attitude of caution. Uh, cautious, he, Lao Tzu says, as one who crosses a river in spring. That means either because of the spring floods or because the ice is still there and uh, you're not quite sure how strong it is because it's beginning to thaw. So, the, what the Taoist tries to develop is a sensibility to the situation. He tries to feel out intuitively what kind of action is required under these circumstances because he feels that he can never discover it analytically with his conscious attention alone. Well, now, to talk in modern Western terms about how this is done, we must realize, of course, <coughs> that we are equipped inside our heads with an absolutely fantastic thing called the brain. With its millions and millions of neuron cells, it is, as it were, the most amazing computer ever devised. Basic to the Taoist attitude to life is that you have that within you and you may if you don't know anything about brains very much call it intuition or something of that kind but you have within you the most amazing uh, logical analyzer that exists uh, in the known world and the point is to get it to work for you 
And instead of trying with conscious attention alone, which can only think of about three things at a time without using a pencil, uh, that is to say, keep three variables in mind at once. Uh, very few people can do four without using a pencil. You can do four if you're a trained musician where you've got, you're playing four different lines of a fugue, say. You're keeping four variables in mind at once. With an organist, uh, you can go from four to six because you've got your two feet and they're playing too. But that uh, requires a high uh, amount of training to be able, with conscious attention, to keep these many variables in mind. But the world around us has infinitely many variables going in it. And you can reason out something with your conscious uh, verbal thinking. Say you want to make a contract in business and uh, you figure out how to make it, whether it will be a good contract, whether it will work, etc., etc. And you think of all these things and write them down and you make the contract and you think that's fine. But one of the variables that you couldn't possibly include in the contract was that your partner would slip on a banana skin and break his neck. Uh, all sorts of things, I mean, the contract might make provisions in it if your lawyer was thoughtful for what was to be done under the case of the disability of any of the parties there too, etc. But uh, eventually there are so many possibilities that can occur that you cannot think of them all. So then the question arises, uh, is it within the power of the human brain to comprehend, because of its immense complexity, in a kind of un- or subconscious way, what the surface consciousness can never grasp. And uh, the, the Taoist would say certainly it can. That you've got to learn to use your brain by allowing it to go to work on your problems without interfering with it. And then it will deliver you a decision. And this is why uh, when, you get to, when you get to the real study of uh, Taoist and Zen Buddhist uh, practice, you get to the point where you learn to act without making decisions. Or rather, to use a more exact word, without choosing. Krishnamurti talks a great deal about being choicelessly aware. And he says freedom is precisely the state of not having to choose. Now that sounds quite paradoxical because we're always talking about freedom of choice. But choice is not a form of freedom in the sense of the word. What is choice in the sense of the word? Choice is the act of hesitation that we make before making a decision. It is a mental wobbling. You know some people when they take up a pen to write, they don't just write, but they jiggle the pen around indecisively like this and then start writing. Or a person comes into a room and wonders who to talk to and sort of is in doubt, you see. In that moment, he's choosing. Whereas a person who uh, comes into a room and decides who to approach, uh, he doesn't wait to choose. We say he is decisive. But that's a funny saying because it means he doesn't stop to decide. So in uh, the training in Zen Buddhism, which is simply a, a Buddhist uh, extension of Taoism, it all, Zen Buddhism arose out of the marriage of Buddhism and Taoism in the 5th century AD. And uh, over the, the following uh, centuries. So they have a way of training you so that you always act without choosing. For example, uh, there was one day a leaky roof and there were a couple of uh, monks attending the Zen master and he said the roof is leaking. One monk disappeared and came back instantly with a sieve and put it under the drips. Another monk after some time came back with a bucket. And the master praised the one who brought the sieve. Now, the action wasn't exactly appropriate. I mean, you know, to catching rain. But the point was that he was in the spirit of the Zen discipline by acting without choosing. 
And you will notice this with certain people. Certain people never hesitate. They always seem, if something needs to be done, they seem somehow simply to grab something and do it. <laughs> you know, which is a kind of a Zen uh, capacity. But, so what happens is this, that the, the, the teacher of Zen constantly throws curves at his students and puts them in dilemma situations where they have to act immediately. Uh, one of the things, of course, that you mustn't do is rush, because rush is a form of hesitation. You, uh, rushing, when a person rushes to get a train, he starts to fall over his own feet. See? So it really holds him up. It's like trying to drive at high speed through the water with a blunt-nosed boat. That's rush. But now what he's trying to get is a kind of a smooth, unhesitating, flowing action that is the response to the challenge. And it must be done uh, in the, uh, what, with what is called uh, another use of this word, move. This is called wunyan in Chinese or munen in Japanese. And this word, nen, is composed of the character meaning now and the character meaning mind heart. Shin. And so has the meaning of a thought. But especially for us, it is well translated by the psychological term blocking. You're blocking, you say to someone, when they hesitate, when they dither, when they stop to choose. So the attitude of Munan or Wunian is the unblocked mind where it doesn't hesitate ever. Just as the river doesn't hesitate when it flows and just when you clap your hands, the sound comes out without hesitation. And when the moon rises, the water doesn't wait to reflect it. It reflects it instantly. So that instant reflection, or it's a kind of resonance, is what is looked for as a response of the individual to his environment. And he does this to the degree that he knows himself to be one with his environment. Then his, his capacity for response increases in according to the way in which he feels that uh, he is simply uh, all of a piece with it and not something that is uh, in it and with a barrier around him through which messages have to get and then their decisions have to be made up and sent out. So then, you could say that a kind of extremely subtle sensory awareness has to be developed as between the individual and his environment so that he feels it out now, today, this sort of talk is very unpopular because scientifically-minded people, especially academic scientists, those who teach in universities, are exceedingly suspicious of intuitive reactions. They say, oh, blah, 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 blah. You can get into all sorts of trouble that way. But the thing that they neglect to, to realize is that everybody uses it. Even the most meticulously careful, analytical, rigorous, sound scientist uses intuitive judgment after a certain point. Why? Because uh, you may accumulate data forever. And you may decide that this is uh, on the whole and uh, taking all due things into consideration and procedures having been worked out that this is the right thing to do. Why do you decide then? Mostly because time's up <laughs> and somebody's pressing for a decision or else you are bored to death with bringing in data because you never know much how much data you need to make a certain decision. And therefore, you may go on collecting data till all is blue, but in the last analysis, you'll work on hunch. 
And so much is actually in the end decided by flipping coins. <coughs> and the pity of flipping coins for making decisions gives you only two choices, heads or tails, one way or the other. The Chinese have a more subtle way of flipping coins. They have a method of a 64-sided coin to flip. So that the, instead of just heads or tails, there are 64 possibilities of coming to a decision when you don't know what to do. This is called the I Ching, or the Book of Changes, where the symbols of yang and yin, that is to say for yang, a straight line undivided, for yin, a line uh, broken in the middle. There are 64 ways of combining six of these lines in a hexagram. And so there is a complex method uh, when you have to make a, gra a grave decision for a tossing. You do it by tossing sticks or coins, and it gives you one of these 64 figures. Now, if you are very wise uh, and have studied uh, the Book of Change for a long time, you don't need to use the book. Uh, you just look at what the figure is, and you can tell what it means. Because, you see, these figures are made up of uh, each six-hexagram figure ha is made up of two threefold components. That has two components, of which this one is water, and this one is heaven. So you will have water over heaven. And a person very skilled in the interpretation will feel out the meaning of water over heaven. But actually, if you are not so skilled, there is the book. And for each of these hexagrams, the book has an oracle. And it tells you uh, in curiously vague and yet curiously precise terms the meaning of this hexagram. And then you in the light of your own situation, make up your mind what it's saying to you. In the light of the problem that you've raised, uh, the question that you've asked, the decision that you had to make, you will find invariably that these 64 choices are one of them, uh, or indeed all of them, but you have to pick one of them because you are, after all, tossing a coin. Uh, but it has some peculiarly appropriate thing to say to you under your circumstances, and it's just like having a conversation with a very, very wise old gentleman. And you must realize that it, today in Asia, uh, this book is still widely used for making business and political decisions, although people who are westernized wouldn't let on, perhaps, that they use it. And so anybody who does politics or does business with Asia should be completely versed in this book. Uh, to know what sort of uh, thinking, uh, what sort of uh, approach uh, might be expected under any circumstances. If you could ever find out what hexagram uh, had fallen when a certain uh, politician had made a decision, it would be immensely enlightening as to his future course of action. In the same way, for example, in dealing with Hitler, uh, our strategists, I don't know if they did, should have been students of astrology. Because he was always consulting astrologers. And therefore, uh, astrology would be much more easy to penetrate than the I Ching. Because uh, you can know Hitler is looking all the time at his own horoscope. Well, we have access to Hitler's horoscope. And so we know what he's thinking about it. But you don't have access to what hexagram Mao Zedong threw when he decided to do something or other. <laughs> so it's a little bit more subtle. Well then, I'm making the point then that our scientists are very suspicious of the intuitive judgment. But nevertheless, they all use it in the end. And so, uh, it has made this suspicion that science has of intuitive judgment has filtered down to the average person in terms of a mistrust of his own intuitions, of the marvelous analytical powers of his own brain. And so we are always in a dither of doubt 
as to whether we're behaving the right way, doing the right thing, and so on and so forth, and lack a certain kind of self-confidence. And if you see you lack self-confidence, you will make mistakes through sheer fumbling. If you do have self-confidence, you may carry, get away with doing entirely the wrong thing. Now, the British have an enormous degree of self-confidence. Uh, they know they're right. And they don't even question it. I mean, there are certain kinds of British types who are absolutely, their aplomb is unbelievable. And uh, you can't shake them. I wouldn't dream of it. They're not even defending themselves. They know they're so right. And therefore they can allow any kind of political revolution, total free speech, all sorts of things can go on, which make Americans very nervous because Americans don't have the same degree of aplomb. They're not quite sure, you see. When you're an aristocrat and you've been brought up for generations in the right schools and uh, there's never any doubt whatsoever, you, you don't even have to uh, mention the fact that you're an aristocrat. See, I mean, that's why aristocrats know how to treat servants. But they never take it out on their servants in the sense of having to emphasize their own superiority. Because they know they're superior. They don't even question it. See? Well, this is an extraordinary kind of nerve that they've built up. And uh, so the only way, you know, you can do this is... First of all, in, in Zen practice, the thing that you have to understand is this. You have to regard yourself as a cloud in the flesh. Because you see, clouds never make mistakes. Did you ever see a cloud that was misshapen? Did you ever see a badly designed wave? <laughs> no, they always do the right thing. Now, so as a matter of fact do we, because we are natural beings, just like clouds and waves. Only uh, we, we, we have complicated games which cause us to doubt ourselves. But if you will treat yourself for a while as a cloud or wave and realize that you can't make a mistake, whatever you do, because even if you do something that seems to be totally disastrous, it'll all come out in the wash somehow or other. Then, through this capacity, you will develop a kind of confidence. And through confidence, you will be able to trust your own intuition. Only the thing that you have to be careful about is, and, and, and many people who have not understood Zen properly fall into trouble here, is that when they take the attitude that I can't possibly make a mistake, they overdo it. Which shows that they don't really believe it. So a lot of people come on and say, well, in Zen, uh, anything goes. Uh, you're naturally with it anyway. You are a Buddha anyhow. And I'm going to prove I'm a Buddha anyhow by breaking all the rules. And so you put on the weirdest, filthiest clothes and you go and steal things and uh, all kinds of things like that. That's overdoing it. That shows that you haven't learned. You don't, you're overcompensating. Because before you were told to do this, do that, and the other, and watch, and be self-conscious, and nervous, and so on. And so you just go to the other extreme. But this is the middle way of knowing it has nothing to do with your decision to do this or not. Whether you decide that uh, you can't make a mistake, or whether you don't decide it, it's true anyway. That you are like cloud and water. And through the, that realization, without overcompensating in the other direction you will come to the point where you begin to be on good terms with your own being and to be able to trust your own brain. But at that level, you are supra-personal. That is to say, uh, when you realize that you stand here as a body, it's as if you see uh, there was, uh, according to certain cosmolog uh, cosmological theories today, a primordial explosion which blew up and created the universe. And you know how it is when you take a bottle of ink and you throw it at a whitewashed wall, smash like that, and it goes splat all over the place. There's a big blob in the center. And then as it goes out, it gets all sorts of little curly cues and wiggles. So you see, the cosmic explosion is still happening. It takes a long time from that big essential bang for the whole thing to go whoosh, 
takes billions of years for it to happen. And it's still happening. And we are the little curlicues out on the edge. See? And we are connected. We are part of the central explosion that originally happened. That, in a certain sense, is in you. You're still manifesting it. You see? So, when you consider yourself as a physical being, consider this hand. It is very ancient. Just like you pick up a stone. Say, how old is the stone? Well, scientists will say, well, it's about, uh, comes from this, the Plasticine age, and it's probably, uh, <laughs> you know, four million years old. But then you think, well, wait, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. You mean four million years old. Where did it come from? What was it before it was a stone? Well, it was something or other. And that goes back, 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 you see. So everything you touch, including yourself, is incredibly ancient goes back to the very beginning of time. So if your mind awakens, you suddenly see all your friends sitting around you looking incredibly ancient. I don't mean in the sense of old and haggard, but like angels, like eternal beings, who were always there from the beginning. ...side and an outside, which are different. On the other hand, if you draw a circle around a donut, the inside and the outside are the same. So, what we are first of all saying is that the Tao, whatever that is, cannot be explained in that sense. So it's important, first of all, to experience it so we know what we're talking about. And in order to go into Taoism at all, we must begin by being in the frame of mind which can understand it. You cannot force yourself into this frame of mind any more than you can smooth disturbed water with your hand. But let's say that our starting point is that we forget what we know or think we know. That we suspend judgment about practically everything. Returning to what we were when we were babies. The subject of this seminar is going to be Taoism as contained in the teachings of Lao Tzu and Zhuang Tzu who lived approximately 400 years or more before Christ separated probably by 100 years from each other <coughs> and as is often repeated, Lao Tzu started out by explaining that the Tao, which can be explained, is not the eternal Tao. And then went on to write a book about it. Also saying, those who say do not know, those who know do not say, because there's nothing to be explained. You must remember that the word explain means to lay out in a plane. That is to put it on a flat sheet of paper. All mathematics is done on a flat sheet of paper until very recent times. But it makes a great deal of difference because this world isn't flat. If you draw a circle on a flat sheet of paper, it has an ins... When we have not yet learned the names or language, and although we have extremely sensitive bodies, very alive senses, 
we have no means of making an intellectual or verbal commentary on what is going on. Now, can you consider that as your state? Just plain ignorant, but still very much alive. And in this state, you just feel what is without calling it anything at all. You know nothing at all about anything called an external world in relation to an internal world. You don't know who you are. You haven't even got the idea of the word you or I. It's before all that. Nobody has taught you self-control. So, you don't know the difference between the noise of a car outside and a wandering thought that enters your mind. They're both something that happens. You don't identify the presence of the thought, which might be just an image, of a passing cloud in your mind's eye and the passing automobile. They happen. Your breath happens. Light all around you happens. Your response to it by blinking happens. So you simply are really unable to do anything. There's nothing that you're supposed to do. Nobody's told you anything to do. You're unable completely to do anything but be aware of the buzz. The visual buzz, the audible buzz, the tangible buzz, the smellable buzz, all buzz. Let's go on. <laughs> Watch it. Don't ask who's watching it. You've no information about that yet. That it requires a watcher for something to be watched. For somebody's idea. You don't know that. And Lao Tzu says, the scholar learns something every day. The man of Tao unlearns something every day. Until he gets back to non-doing. And that's what we're in at the moment. Just simply, without comment, without an idea in your head, be aware. What else can you do? Don't try to be aware. You are. You'll find, of course, that you can't stop the commentary going on in your head. But at least you can regard it as interior noise. Listen to your chattering thoughts as you listen to the singing of a kettle. We don't know what it is we're aware of. Especially when you take it all together. And there's this sense of something going on. 